This episode is brought to you by freedadcourse.com. You are always one conversation away from changing your life. And the power of hello is something that I subscribe to every single day. And I'm always saying hello to new people everywhere I go. Increasing your opportunity, increasing your connection, and getting access to the solutions to the problems that you are facing, whether you're on active duty or just beginning your veteran transition, or you've been transitioning out for 20 years. On the other side of hello are the solutions that you're looking for. Again, head on over to freedadcourse.com. Get your five-episode audio course to create more connection, create more friendships, and get back to living the life that you're trying to design. Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome to episode 28. Today's episode is one that was very powerful. It rocked me to my core, and I know it probably will with you as well. Today's episode with Bob Martin shares coming to the edge of suicide and hearing in his in his words God reach down and tell him that it wasn't his time and pulling back and being able to look back because it's been almost 30 years on what his life has transpired since that moment of walking back from the cliff. Bob shares a deep story of being in that pit, being in the your whole life has just crumbled around you. How do you come back from that? what his role as a father was before and how he viewed that role after. And ultimately, if you were ever looking for hope for what you're going through to the other side, Bob is a perfect example as a lighthouse of what can be on the other side of something as horrible as a divorce and even as dangerous as being on the edge of suicide. If you're listening to this and you're a dad and you're thinking about it or maybe you're even days away from doing it, reach out to someone because Bob shares a powerful story. And if Bob doesn't bring you home, find someone that will. Find someone that is going to breathe the life into you and then give you the rope to climb out of that pit. If you don't want to reach out to myself or you don't have a friend, the Veterans Crisis Hotline is one that is available. It's 1-800-273-8255. Find someone to reach out and touch because you need to get that voice outside of your head. And once you get it outside your head, you realize the ludicrousy of what it's telling you to do. But in that moment, it is the loudest voice in the room, but it's not actually speaking any words, but they feel just as real. And Bob shares how we need to find a community to grow through that and get to the other side and really what life can be on the other side. He shares some powerful examples of his kids reflecting on that early story he talks about the guilt of he carried through most of his life even till to this day or till this year of what that had impact on his family and it was the exact opposite what came back from his kids and it was a very powerful story of how just a full retrospect of looking back with essentially 21 2020 perspective in his case because it has been almost 30 years since this happened And it inspires hope and that lighthouse that you need to find land again. That sea can be rough. I've been there. I've been in that pit. You need that community around you to hand you the rope to climb out of that pit, whether it be that your community at church like he found or whether that be a Facebook group, whether that be a close friend, find someone. This episode is meant to bring dads home. And this episode is one of the reasons why this podcast exists because of the 22 number that 22 veterans kill themselves every single day. And I only wanted to save one. And that was my focus with this podcast, which was the dad. And if I can save one dad from not being able to hug their kids and their kids not being able to hug their dad that night, this podcast is a success. We look at our role as a father very differently before and after serving most likely. And Bob shares how his role should changed before and after his suicide or his suicide attempt there is a role we play and only when we come home mentally and physically 
can we truly become that dad that we're meant to be? So let Bob's story inspire you. Let Bob's story inspire you to be a stronger man and father and also humble enough. This is the key part, humble enough to ask for help. We were not meant to do life alone. I've repeated that many times in the podcast. It's why we have a Facebook group that's also the link in the show notes. If you are in that pit, find the Facebook group, find someone to reach out and touch. I first got in contact with Bob by doing my mortgage last year. He was my uh, mortgage loan officer. Didn't know about this story at the time. I knew that he was in the military, but didn't know about this story until he posted it on Facebook. That video is also in the show notes on Facebook as well. So go down to the show notes, click the link, and you can check out that video as well. Very powerful. If you love this episode, click the video. It's about a four-minute video that uh, really opens it up and puts it in living color, literally. And you can hear Bob's own words um, and his reactions as he tells the story. So in the last part of the episode, we also dive into a little bit. We change gears and dive in a little bit of mortgage and VA home loans about some of the horror stories. He doesn't give really any uh, recommendations, but he definitely gives you the feeling and the, w- and the perspective on the mortgage industry he has and also why he does it the way he does. Because in the tagline of every one of his emails is he reminds me and every customer that it's not just a mortgage, it's a relationship. His contact information is also in the, in the bottom. He's only licensed in the state of Wisconsin. So if you're in the state of Wisconsin, he can do a mortgage for you. If you want to reach out to him to find someone else in a different state, Fairway Mortgage, where he works, is also licensed in all 50 states, and he can go ahead and help you get connected with someone in a different state to help you do a VA home loan. It's game-changing all the way through. If you have the time, make sure you get to the end, because every part, even the, the, the mortgage part, resonates back to his story and why he is the way he is and why he shows up in his life and his grandkids and his kids' life the way he does. So without further ado, let's get started with today's episode with Bob Martin. Today's guest served in the Air Force from 1978 to 1982. He got out and did what most veterans do. He started a family, had five kids, and then was hit with an abrupt change to his life when his wife's wife asked him for a divorce. He found him on the other side of that trying to figure things out again. I'll let him tell that part of his story, but he's on the other side of that and now has six grandkids and is happily married enjoying the memories of being a grandfather. He was actually my mortgage guy when I bought my second house last summer, and he now helps veterans and families walk through the biggest decision they have in their life, buying a home. Bob, welcome to the show today. Well, thanks, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity. Go ahead and describe what your, your life looks like having uh, six grandkids, and, and uh, go ahead and unpack a little bit of what that uh, life was like after your divorce. Well, my life up to the divorce was I think pretty standard that most guys, you know, you get married, you have family and you work hard to build a life for you and your family and your wife to support them and whatever. And after 14 years of doing that, my wife at the time kind of surprised me and let me know that she no longer wanted to be married. Um, That was a really, really difficult thing for me to hear because working my whole life up to that point, we were just getting to the point where my youngest daughter would have started kindergarten in that fall. And so I was thinking, you know, here we'd made it. I was 29 years old. I had five kids. Or at one point in time, I was 29 years old. I had five kids. This is now I'm 34 with five kids. And I'm thinking, you know, we finally made it. We made it through the hard part. And from here on out, it should be easier than what it was up to that point. So I kind of look at things like, man, everything I've worked for, everything I've struggled for, everything I've, I've tried to put together is just falling apart. I had no idea how in the world I was ever going to make enough money to support two families. I mean, we barely had enough to support one, and now we're going to be supporting two. But the biggest, one of the biggest concerns that I had was how often am I going to get to see my kids? Granted, I worked a lot, and so I didn't get to see them all that much because I was at work, but I, I always came home to them at night and I could tuck them into bed, you know, or kiss them if they were already in bed or see them in the morning when they got up. And now I'm thinking, my gosh, I'm not going to get to see my kids hardly at all. I, I just figured my life as I knew it was over. And at one point in time, after a rather 
heated argument with my wife, I, um, I just stood up and I looked at her and I, she had said something about not caring. And I said to her, fine, then don't care. And I walked up to our bedroom and I grabbed a 12 gauge shotgun that my dad had given me for my 12th birthday. And I grabbed two shells because I wanted to make sure that if I wussed out on the first one that I had a backup. And I got in my car and I was going to drive out to a field behind a friend's house I was staying at. And that was going to be the end of it. I figured everybody would just be a lot better off if I wasn't around. So driving down the road and as I'm driving, I all of a sudden hear, I mean, I didn't hear anything audibly, but I, in, in my head, I very distinctly heard, you can't do this. I mean, to the point where it, it kind of freaked me out. I, st I literally stopped my car in the middle of the road. Then I pulled over to the side of the road and was just thinking to myself going, wow, um, I really can't do this. And so I turned my car around, took the gun back to my house, gave it to my future ex-wife and said, here, put this somewhere where I can't, where I can't find it and drove away. And that was really what I, I mean, looking back, I refer to that as my two by four in the head moment, because up to that point, I thought it was just, I had to do this all on my own. I got to that point and it was like, nope, I can't do this. So from that point forward, I took a different direction with my life. Up to that point, it was church was something that I went to on Sunday and the rest of the week was I had to pound out an existence and make a living and take care of everything. After that, I started being more active with my faith, um, started reading the Bible. Uh, church was a little bit more than just a Sunday thing. I actually started to get involved and started to put my faith more into my life than just on a Sunday. And from there on out, I mean, I'm not going to say that the rest of my divorce was easy, but it was easier. I went through quite a few things in the divorce, even after that, that were very, very difficult. But I met a woman after my divorce, um, or I should say I met her actually during my divorce. My divorce took almost two years to get done. And we've been married now for 22, going on 23 years. And uh, mm -hmm. she has a daughter. So together we have six children. And I have now have six grandchildren. So and my life has turned out better now than I could have ever imagined. If someone would offer me the opportunity to go back and change what happened, um, not that I would wish divorce on anybody. I actually would wish that I would have learned, figured this out without having to go through the divorce. But if the option was to just not go through the divorce or not figure it out, I would, I would have to go through the divorce to figure it out because it just... It just changes how you live and how you look at things. And, and I couldn't imagine going back even if I had the opportunity. So, I remember when you shared this story in a video on Facebook, and that's what inspired me to ask you to come on the podcast. And it hit me like a bag of bricks that I had known to call you a friend last year during the process of getting a mortgage. And then hearing this backstory was, uh, was just incredible. Before the moment leading up to the divorce and even the moment where you started driving off. Did you have close friends where you were talking about what was going on in your life or was it a conversation in your head only? I really, I have friends or had friends. I still have friends. I, at the time, didn't have anybody that I would really, that I was, that I considered really close that I would sit and talk with about this. I had a friend who was letting me stay at his house and he was probably the closest friend I would have had at the time. And he knew what was going on only because obviously I was staying at his house. Um, this was just something that going through a divorce, I didn't get married to get a divorce. I never thought I would get a divorce. I just had five kids. I mean, you, you, you were recommitting each time that this is going to work out in the end. Well, it was, it was odd because, uh, we had just had a conversation. This happened, the divorce. She let me know in January of 95 that she no longer wanted to be married. And that Christmas before, Christmas of 94, um, this friend I stayed with and his wife were going through a divorce. And she looked at me and said, my wife looked at me and said, don't ever do that to me, what, what so-and-so is doing to so-and-so. And I looked at her and I said, well, I'm, I'm not planning on going anywhere. So less than a month later, 
month and a half, maybe, all of a sudden I find myself in the same boat. So it really, I mean, obviously when you're married from the age of 20 to 34, um, you do a lot of change and a lot of growing up. And, but, but you just, this is just something that you just never really think about. And we had our struggles, we had our problems, but this just kind of came right out of left field and just really, um, I mean, if anybody, anybody that knew me, if anybody had come up to me before this and said to me that I would ever get to a point in my life, Ben, where, where I would grab a shotgun and start heading out to the field. And I'm serious. This was not a, this was not a, Oh, look at me and a cry for help. This was a, I'm out of here. There's just mm-hmm. no reason for me to be around. If anybody had ever told me that I would have done that, I would have looked at them and said, Oh man, do you have the wrong guy? Uh, obviously you don't know me as well as you think you do, but man, in the right set of circumstances, um, anybody's possible of anything, I guess. I've often thought about when a veteran transitions either from war or even just in general, because the military and even the Air Force, I'm sure the Air Force even more back then, it was probably more strict than it is now. Your emotions are something that are a liability and you're not meant to acknowledge them and or even talk out loud about them. And I think it, even more so now because there is the society is more complicated that you by keeping those voices inside our head and what we're thinking or feeling during any moment of of tragedy whether we lost a friend in war or even that we just find ourselves homeless on the other side of transition that that voice becomes so loud that you almost don't hear anything else around it and that that voice ultimately comes to the conclusion that the world is better without you. That's exactly, I mean, that's a hundred percent accurate statement because I, I was literally sitting on the floor listening to my ex-wife at the time or my wife at the time, um, kind of pointing the finger and very adamantly telling me everything I ever did wrong during the course of our marriage. And it, and I was already depressed. I mean, I, I would drive to work and uh, hear a song on the radio and I'd just literally start crying. I'd get to work, I'd think of something and I'd start crying. I'd try to drive home, I'd start crying. I, it was just, it was, it was probably the worst time and not probably, it was definitely the most darkest, deepest, worst time in my entire life. So here I am trying to figure out what to do and how to make this better and how to fix it. And all I'm hearing is what a piece of dirt I was and have been. And you're right. I mean, I heard this voice in my head and there was just no arguing with it. It was just like, you know what, this is what you're going to do. And this is how you're going to fix the problem. You can't fix it any other way. So obviously you're a big liability for everybody around you. I haven't been a good dad. haven't been a good husband. Um, why am I even here? And I, like I said, I literally just, why, I mean, it, walk upstairs, grab a gun, walk out of the house, get in a car and drive. It was probably five or 10 minute process. Mm-hmm. and get to the end of that. And honestly, if I would not heard that voice in my head that told me I couldn't do this, you and I probably wouldn't be talking because I, I probably wouldn't be here. So uh, I have no other explanation for that other than the fact that God just didn't want me to be done. He had, a, he had other plans for me. And yeah, the divorce was tough and wouldn't wish a divorce on my worst enemy. But you know what? The Bible says that God takes everything and works it for the good of those who believe and are called according to his purpose. And some doesn't say it's going to be easy. Doesn't say it's going to be fun. Doesn't say good things are always going to happen to you. Doesn't say it's going to be clean. Exactly. But it will work out for the best. It's just when you're in mm-hmm. that position and I, and I have a new respect for people who find themselves in that position, having been there myself, uh, it's not a position for the weak. It's not a, it's not, you're not weak because you're there is what I mean. You, you, you're, you're not, it, it doesn't mean you're a weak person because you're having those thoughts. It just means that you, you have reached the end of your rope and you don't really see any possible way out. And the problem with that is when you're so deep down in the mud, you just can't see the way out. And fortunately for me, um, God was able to get my attention before Mm-hmm. before it was too too late for me to do anything about it. So I'm very grateful for that. And when you fall into the pit as a man, that pit can feel like a mile deep 
and it's completely dark. You might not even be able to see the, the top. Oh, and absolutely. The, the best part of having a community, which almost many veterans don't have any community after they transition, and many barely have a community other than their brotherhood while they serve, which is, is bonded, but it's not in a way that ultimately deals with the issues you might have at home, that you need that community to throw that rope down to help pull you up and you need someone to know when you fell and in your case you you didn't have that but luckily you had the the bigger rope come down from all the way up high to pull you back and um i've been in online communities for the last three years and i can't tell you how many times someone's thrown a rope to me because i really just i just was watching a little facebook live video this morning and this guy really explained it well that a sheet of paper tear is extremely easy but combine a sheet of paper and a phone book, you can't even try. And that's ultimately what you need that community for because together you are that much stronger. By itself, you can blow away with the good breeze and rip in peace just with one little, little effort. And I think what you found on the other side of all that was your, your community in the church and you found those people to help carry your life with you. I, I often repeat in the podcast that we're not meant to lift everything that life gives us. And in the Marine Corps and any branch, the, your back is the first thing the military abuses. And if you can't lift something, it's not, oh, we need to get a bigger fork truck. It's, oh, we don't have enough Marines or airmen or Navy to, or Navy men to, or not Navy men, seamen to, to lift it. So they get more people lifting it. And I've equated that to life that, when you have something so heavy on your heart that you're not meant to lift everything that you that you get put on your heart every day and you're meant to share the load with others. It's a very true statement. And unfortunately as guys, a lot of times, you know, that's an easy concept when you're actually serving in the military, because that's how, that's how you're trained. That's how you do things. But when well, you're not you trained out, to carry it into life, that's the, tra that's correct. the part. Yeah. Exactly. When you when you transition out and you're you're going through things, you know, I've I've done some missions trips down to uh, Haiti and down to the Dominican Republic, and I've always told people, when you're down there, it's so easy to rely on God to provide things because, in all honesty, there's some things that you you look at down there and you go, there's no way that this is ever going to get done um, unless God steps in and and helps do it because. It's just not, I mean, there's just nothing there. But boy, as soon as you touch back on uh, U.S. soil, it seems like all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, now God's too busy down in Haiti, so I'm back on, back on my life, and uh, I have to now take care of everything on my own power because I can do this. And I think that's the same thing that happens with a lot of guys. Even, even just dealing with life in general, it, you just get to the point where it's like, okay, what's the old saying? Grab myself by my bootstraps and you know, pull myself up by my bootstraps and just yeah. fuck up and, and go for it and suck it up buttercup. <laughs> exactly right. And it, and it's just not easy to do. And, and I, I know when, when, when I was going through the divorce, it was, it was a, it was such a huge sense of failure. I mean, I can't tell you how, how much that part of it really hurt because I had worked so hard to get things for my family and for my kids and to, to get us to where we were and then to have all of that just taken away. And I really had no control over it. I, I just felt like a complete absolute failure. And in fact, this is not a story that, that I had run around, ran around sharing after it happened. This was 1994 into 96. And I didn't really start talking with other people about it until probably you know mid 2000s going later and it just so happened when we were in Haiti that they wanted to share you know our story <laughs> I don't think I don't think they were quite ready for the story that I shared but when when I shared it and then we got back that was in one of the people that was on our trip actually was one of the uh, workers at the church she asked me if I would consider doing doing that as a video and I was like Oh boy, you know, I don't know. I mean, I share it with individual people. I've be, I've shared it with customers who come into my office and you do a mortgage for a couple and they call you up two years later, three years later, and we're getting a divorce and one of them comes in to talk and 
you just start sharing. I mean, you share it with them because you've got that in common, but it's not something that you just walk around and, you know, mm -hmm. sit down to lunch with a bunch of guys and go, Hey, let me tell you a story. <laughs> let me tell you a story. Um, but that just, story just, is a gift that reminds people <laughs> that you can get to the other side and you can still find light even in, when you're in the darkest of times. Exactly. I'd like to unpack a little bit uh, before the divorce. What did you see your role as being a good dad? What did, how did you define that in your head? My, when I, I was 20 years old when I got married, had my first child when I was 21. And as I mentioned earlier, I had five kids by the time I was 29. And I looked at my role as I needed to take care of these six people, my wife and five children. I needed to make sure they had a place to live. They had a, a car to drive. They had food to eat. They had clothes to wear. Um, I figured my wife was home to take care of the other needs. I needed to take care of the financial needs. And I worked, I worked a lot of hours, actually got fired um, in there from a job that I had. I really didn't like. So it was kind of a, another one of those God moments where uh, had I not gotten fired from that job, I was 30 years old, 31 years old and uh, got fired. That's how I ended up getting into mortgage business, by the way, which is a position that, or a job that I love immensely compared to the job that I had before that. So I went through that and it was just, I don't know, just moving forward and just providing and everything was coming together. And then the divorce hit and it was like, oh my gosh, for the first time in our lives, we actually had money in the bank and uh, things, I thought things were going to really be good. So it's just funny how your outlook on things change. If, if I could go back and start over again, knowing what I know now, and of course, this is easy to say because hindsight's always twenty twenty. but when you're, when you're 20 years old or 28 years old or whatever, you've got a family to support as a guy, that, that's really your that's what you live for. Your identity. Exactly. And but I also understand now that time at home is is important too. And maybe had I not worked quite as many hours, maybe they wouldn't have had quite as many new clothes or whatever. Maybe we could have not had two cars. I had a company car and we had a different car. Um, maybe things would have been different. Maybe I wouldn't be divorced. Maybe my life would be so much different. But you know, you can beat yourself up over and over and over for woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, all I know is that I didn't quite do it the way that it probably should have been done. But in the end, um, outside of the divorce, my, my kids, I mean, I have an absolutely awesome relationship with all of my children. I've got a wife that we have a really good relationship. Uh, I have a stepdaughter who I'm basically her father. I'm basically her dad. Um, she has five brothers and sisters that they all get along just impeccably uh, when they're all together. There are some people that don't even know that they're not blood relatives because they're just that close. So I think about all of that and how none of that would have happened had I not gone through the divorce. And even, even my kids will tell me, you know, dad, I don't, I don't know that I would go back either because Mary, my current wife has been such a blessing to my life. You know, she's, she's been a second mom and, and they're very, very, very close. Mm -hmm. So I think that says a lot. What did, how did you, what do you see, or on the other side of that divorce, how would you have defined your newfound purpose as a father? It was funny how before my divorce, uh, I, I would go to work at, you know, seven, eight o'clock in the morning and I'd work till, you know, if the busy time during the summers, whatever, I'd work till seven, eight o'clock at night. Of course, this was before you could take your work home and work on a computer and you can hook up through computers. If, if I wasn't at work, I really wasn't able to work. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I, I could put in a 12, 14 hour day and not really think too much about it. After the divorce, when I've got my kids, um, ultimately I ended up having them 50, 50. So I would have them maybe Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So I would, I would find myself arranging my schedule so that I could be home um, and, and pick them up from school or do whatever. Now, had I, had I done that prior or, or had I arranged my schedule prior, I mean, I had anybody asked me to do it prior to the divorce, I would have said, I can't do that. I have to be at the office because people want to come in and 
talk about their loans. They want to apply for mortgages and they want to do that at four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So prior to the divorce, I would ask people, when do you want to come in? And I'd let them say, well, okay, I want to come in at five or six or six 30 after the divorce or during the divorce, when I had to be home with my kids, I would find myself saying, well, I've got an appointment available at three o'clock or I've got one at two o'clock or I've got one at, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, which one works best for you? Rather than giving them the option, I gave them a choice. And I think that was the difference is my mindset was I need to not only work, but I also have to be home because I need to be there with my kids. And, and for a couple of years, two, three years after the divorce, I wasn't married. So it was, I had to be there. After I got married, my mindset was, well, I don't want my new wife feeling like, you know, now that I'm married, now I'm going to be gone for 14 hours again. And she's got to watch my kids. Cause that wasn't the point. Mm-hmm. The point of having my kids was for me to be there and to be a father and to spend time with them and hang out with them. And so it just meant I had to change how I thought about things to make sure that I could do that. And I can imagine you're even through all of that divorce, you probably saw yourself as a failure in the eyes of your kids, but probably now looking back, your kids would probably give you the advice that like, dad, you probably never stopped being our hero, even through it all. Well, it's funny that you should ask that because that, that sense of feeling like a failure and um, how that might have impacted my kids was something that even up until last summer was something that I still was feeling. And my youngest daughter and I had a conversation one day and I, and I said to her, I said, you know, I'm really sorry that you had to grow up in a broken family. And she goes, broken family. I mean, she was five years old when the divorce started going on six and she goes, dad, she says, I don't look at my family as a broken family. I look at my family as a blended family. I've got Mary as, as a second mom. And I've got a, a younger sister that I would have never had had you not gone through that. She says, my, I don't think my life was bad at all. So I don't know what you're talking about. And it kind of hit me when I had that conversation with her here. I'm carrying around some it's of this burning. guilt. Yeah, exactly. And my kids looked at it completely different. And that was really, that was really a, a game changer for me um, in how I thought about things I mean, you still feel like, geez, I wonder what would have happened yeah, had still play it the not happened. Game. But yeah, but, but talking yeah. to them, it it just it just doesn't seem like it's been it, it seems like it's been more of a factor for me in that regard than it has been for them. So I need to let that go. Mm-hmm. And she gave you a very big gift there to give you permission to let it go. Absolutely. Watch the Frozen movie and sing the song. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed find a good a grandchild that loves it that's uh i think oh, they all through, like it anyway we we have that movie so yeah through all of that uh that judging of yourself that feeling of not being a good dad there's part of what i think that veterans get stuck in and every dad whether he's a veteran or not and that's our legacy and that despite our own shortcomings our legacy is our kids they are the best chance we have to make an impact far beyond the reaches of what we have for time on this earth. And generally they will always go light years further than we think they will. And they will always look at us in a greater, almost like a Superman or in a taller fashion. We will always be taller to them than we are in real life. Despite however we frame it in our head. And it, That's it, a very true statement. And it's, uh, it, look, I mean, the other part that I like about your story is that you had a lot of, let's call it uh, manure added on to your life. And I've always liked to explain that when you want something to grow really well, you often have to have manure and flowers can grow from that flower bed. And no matter what happens in your life, a flower can grow from what is the biggest steaming pile of manure and a flower can grow on the top of it. That is the most beautiful flower that you've ever seen. And you often need that on top of a a garden to make something grow from it. So it's, it's always hard in the moment, but I think what the trick is 
if there is one, is to share the load because that's ultimately what's going to allow you to move through it faster, more emotionally recover from it, and then just get to the other side where you can start to see how your life will start flowing again in a river and get out of that log jam. So I'm sure you felt like a log jam, like your life was just bottled up waiting to explode and it almost did explode in your life and uh, getting that river to flow again um, was the trick. Yeah, it's, it's uh, something that I would recommend as well to anybody that's feeling down in the dumps or in the middle of the pit or whatever, however you want to describe it. When you're in that kind of a situation, the best thing that you can do is to try to reach out to someone mm -hmm. uh, and just talk about it. Because after my uh, little car drive there, I did, I ended up going and talking to a uh, psychiatrist who helped me get on some medications that helped get me, get my ship righted. It took, took about a month and a half or two months before I really stopped having the big wild swings. One minute I'd be way up, one, and next minute I'd be way down. It helped to even me out, but just talking to somebody and, realize, and having them kind of affirm that what I was saying was not, yeah. you know, I wasn't crazy because I was feeling this way, um, that it was natural and something normal and that something that I probably needed to go through because obviously I had just suffered a rather uh, painful loss and loss is loss. It doesn't matter if it's loss of life or what have you, but there's a process you have to go through. And, and I would suggest that a lot of, a lot of people, guys and gals, both who might be going through something like this, don't try to, don't try to pound it out by yourself. Don't, don't man up or buck up like we talked about earlier. Have you ever had someone message you and say they, you saved their life by sharing your story? I haven't. Um, I had a woman come up to me a couple of weeks after and I was ushering at church and she was chatting with me and I had done her mortgage and she mentioned to me, she goes, she looks at me and goes, well, you know my story, right? And I said, well, I knew that your husband had passed away just prior to doing your mortgage. She goes, well, he committed suicide. And she was struggling with it on the other side of being a survivor and mm. having to deal with that and trying to struggle with that and, and whatever. So her and I ended up having a rather nice conversation. Um, she was obviously very emotional, but she gave me a big hug and said, well, thank you because hearing my story and seeing it helped her get going in, in a direction because she mm -hmm. says this has been like I think two or three years she says I just can't get over this so it was something that encouraged her to to look for some help and to kind of move forward from there and and uh, reach out and see what she could do to try to get over that end of it unfortunately those people those of us that have gone through that I wasn't when I was driving my car down to that field I wasn't thinking about what my kids would do, how, how, will, how would they survive this? How would they look at this? How what would that scar it? leave on their heart? Exactly. And that's something that had I, as, as important as my children are to me, if I would have been able to think along those lines at that point in time, I probably would have never gone that direction, but my mind just wasn't, wasn't I wasn't there. able to think that way. Mm -hmm. hey. How did your kids react when they first found out that that almost happened? You know, we never really talked about it. I, I, I never really talked to them about it until, um, until this video was made. Um, I, it was, of course, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. The young lady that came to our house to do the video, um, when they asked me if I would do my, my story, I said, sure. So they send somebody out from the church to do the video and, and interview me and all this kind of stuff. When she came out for the second time, she goes, well, did they tell you when they're going to air this? And I went, I have absolutely no clue. And she goes, well, they're going to do it on Easter Sunday. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, oh, good. Probably the most uh, attended church day of the year, second, maybe only to Christmas. Um, all of a sudden, I was really nervous and really um, anxious about having it aired. Uh, and I invited, I had invited my kids to come to church with me on Easter. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if they come, <laughs> I guess, guess I should it. maybe, yeah, I guess I should maybe let them, 
let them know what's going on. So I talked again to my youngest daughter and, and said to her, I said, well, my testimony is going to be shown in a video. And she goes, well, that's really cool. And I said, well, you know what my story is, right? And she goes, all I know is it was something about a gun and that you thought you needed to um, end things. So she kind of knew mm-hmm. maybe from her but mother. I don't know. Words. Exactly. And so when I talked to her about it, that was really her first um, exposure to my story. Again, I, it, this was, this was just this two months ago. So this is 2019 and we're talking back in 1995. So mm-hmm. never really sat him down and talked to any of them about it. What did she say when you told her about it at the end? Did she give you any same words of wisdom of when she, when you mentioned about the divorce? She just said, well, I didn't know that. She says, that's uh, I, I didn't know the whole story. She says, that's pretty cool. So and it reminds me that maybe I should sit down and have a conversation with the other five now. And, and uh, well, I guess four of them and then this, the, my, my stepdaughter. And I'm sure even in, in ways you probably may not consciously acknowledge, especially being it's so fresh still with this year where you're really uh, confronting it with the video and your family, uh, just getting it off your chest so that you you no longer carry any form of shadow related to this like literally that shadow is no longer on your heart it's now filled with light because everyone knows well it is easier it's easier to think about it and to talk about it now than it was i mean again when i found out that they were doing this on easter sunday i found out about a month before that month i mean my my wife will tell you and the people in our life group will tell you that i was i was very 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 uncomfortable and I almost think, you know, and, and this is this is a strange thought for me to have, but I, I just, I, again, I don't know where else to go with this. I honestly think that that video being shown on Sunday, I'm sure there were some people who were in attendance that it, it, it made a, probably a huge difference in their life. And I'm thinking that Satan probably did not really want that video shown. And he was, I think, attacking me. And making me so uncomfortable. I mean, I could have called the church at any point in time and said, you know what, I'm not really comfortable. I don't, I don't want that to play. But I didn't do that. And as soon as I walked out of church on Easter Sunday, after, I mean, I got there, I, I ushered at the nine o'clock service and I went to the 1030 service. So I really was there for two services, walking in to usher at the, the 730 people were just leaving. And some of them are walking by you. And all of a sudden they do that kind of a double look like, oh, You're that, guy. <laughs> that was really, yeah, yeah, that was really uncomfortable. But when I walked out of there after the second service that we attended, that feeling of anxiety, that feeling of, of just angst, um, I haven't had that problem since. So and anxiety comes from the lack of control. And I can imagine, I, I've really equated fear in my head, unless you're really going to die from whatever is going to kill, whatever you're fearful of. It's mostly, it's not, a lot of it's tied to just our caveman brain that 3,000 years ago, that kept you safe from lions, tigers, and bears. But now anytime you, it, your brain senses an emotional state change that has become comfortable to, it literally turns on the fear mechanism to try to hide what's ever potentially going to happen because it likes where it's at. It's very comfortable at being where it's at. And um, I have... Uh, colloquialism that I often repeat in the podcast and essentially one of the reasons why I have a podcast now is the more something scares me the more something's amazing on the other side so literally this fear that you walked through head first um, just going through you gave the world the gift of going first and then gave everyone permission that anyone thinking in that same way just makes them wake up almost it's like an awakening for some many people it's like walking tapping them on the shoulder and saying hey it's time to come home well when you and i were talking before this i mentioned that i had a a customer of mine who uh, as they're in church on easter sunday at the nine o'clock service when i'm ushering as the video is playing his wife leans over and whispers to him that's you Mm -hmm. that's your story and and about three minutes after that she leans over and goes that's Bob. That's our mortgage guy. So as they walk out, I'm ushering. He comes over. He shakes my hand and he says, 
thank you for sharing that. He says, I really would like to sit down with you and share my story with you. We have a real similar story. And so you're right. It gave him permission. I don't know. I didn't ask him specifically, but it didn't sound like he had really talked with anybody about that up to the point where him and I sat down in my office and, and had a conversation. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if that, if if what I did helps someone to be able to talk about their situation, then as far as I'm concerned, this was something well worth worth mm-hmm. putting together. And I was thinking, I like lighthouse analogies, and in a lot of ways, if if a dad uh, is out there in the sea of life, no longer able to see land, your story in some ways is that lighthouse telling them. I'm on land right now. Keep following me through whatever you're going through and you'll get to land and get to where you need to go. Because that is your story is that beacon of light that in such a dark time, you're the guy that shines a light in someone's life that they can't see where to go. Well, if it helps one person, our CEO, that's one of the things that he always, he sends out little tweets and little things. Um, very Christian oriented and he'll send out a, a, a tweet or whatever, an email and just say, if it helps one person, then he'll throw this thing on there. And, and that's really true. I mean, because if, if my story helps one person and that person then helps another person, eventually you've got a whole bunch of people helping a whole bunch of people. It's and the ripple effect on a pond. Better. Exactly. The ripples just keep going and going. And once the story just starts rippling, you, you almost have no control over what you going first has uh has done has anyone almost or tried to inspire you to write a book about it uh no nope i no haven't had that no, 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 book deals no. no. <laughs> no i think it might be a a, a, a three-page book but <laughs> I, I would think it'd be more than the three pages there was a book oh. i read uh early in my dad's journey it was called the dadly book of open by jason mckenzie and his wife ended up killing herself uh just she was just not mentally uh sane and she they got divorced and she ended up killing herself and she was telling this he tells a story the morning that he had his daughters came downstairs and he had to tell them that your mom's no longer with us that story was almost 200 pages of what he the lessons he learned that vulnerability taught him and he often will repeat if you hear him ever speak that going first is often the best gift you can give the world because so many people are just waiting for someone else to go first and whatever you have on your heart, that story can be the one that makes someone wake up. Even if it's not as um, hard as your story, even something as simple as friendship can be something that realizes that like, you know what, I wish I had more friends in my life. Maybe this is something I can do as well. Well, we'll have to take that under advisement. I I don't see a book deal in the future, but one never knows. It, it, you don't have to have a book deal to self-publish on Amazon. <laughs> oh, that's true. I wrote, uh, all you need is a PDF and uh, a login to Amazon, and you can start posting it there. And uh, you get the profits and directly you don't actually have to worry about Amazon gets some portion and you can even pick a charity that you would like to donate those char- profits to and let your story get permission for others to tell theirs. There you go. Maybe let's switch gears just a little bit because I'd like to take advantage of some of your wisdom of being a mortgage officer, but then also really enjoying doing uh, VA loans, which is something that's a hot mess kind of because Everybody and their mother thinks they can try to make a dime doing VA loans. And we've joked a few times of all the random mail you get about your VA loan once you sign up for yours. I'd like to maybe have you share like if there was four to five different things that you wish every veteran knew before they enter a VA loan to go eyes wide open. And I'm reminded every time you email me and every piece of mail you send me that your uh, philosophy for business is, it's not just a mortgage, it's a relationship. And that your best interests are not always on the other side with the person you're dealing with, based on some of the horror stories you've told me as well. Well, for me, uh, the business that I'm in, 
I mean, just being honest, anybody can do a mortgage. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to throw some numbers on a piece of paper, use a computer underwriting system. I mean, look, all they're doing is allowing people to have direct access to the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac underwriting system. And then you plug your own information in based on the information that you plug into it, the system's going to generate a pre-approval. But the problem is, is if the information you put in is not accurate, I mean, most people don't understand because you don't do it often. You don't understand what information you can and can't use. Um, I have people, I mean, we have online applications that we use for our system as well. So I encourage people to go online and get their application started only because it saves us some time either face to face or on the phone. And a lot, a lot of times people will put in, you know, on both sides of the issue, they'll put in their net income, we use gross, or they might put in, uh, a, they're a, maybe they're a uh, base plus commission type of a person, but they've only been in that position for a year. So they'll put in what they anticipate their commission to be going forward. Well, those are numbers that in some cases you can't use those numbers or you're you going to get an erroneous, right. You're going to get an erroneous approval. So I, I, unfortunately the industry is moving away from having individual loan officers and they're going to a service called a call center. And I actually had my first person ever ask me this question in October last year, I had a, a lady call me up and she asked me how I process my applications. And in almost 30 years of doing this, I've never been asked that question. And I even, I even said to her, I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. What exactly are you trying to figure out? And she goes, well, I had started this process uh, last fall with another lender and ended up not buying a home. But what, every time I would call in, you know, the one time I got somebody in California, the next time I called in, I got somebody in Illinois, then I got somebody in Pennsylvania. They never knew who I was. They never knew what was going on on my file. And they even confused me with another customer and sent me somebody else's paperwork. She says, I'm just wondering, how do you process your loan? <laughs> and then I said, okay, well, now I understand. Basically, I do my own processing. We have a processing staff at Fairway and we can use them but I'm the only one who contacts any of my customers. If a customer calls in and wants, has a question, they shoot me an email, they get a call back from me or they get an email from me. And to me, having grown up in the business since 1991, I mean, that's just how I do things. To me, that personal service is what sets me apart from pretty much anybody else in the business. So you mentioned my, my tagline. It's a relationship, not just a mortgage, because to me, that's what this is. I take my brand and I get paid for what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to let everybody know that I don't do what I do for free. But if all I did was work because I got paid, my job would not be what it is to me. I have people that I consider friends that I do business with. And it's really important to me to have that relationship from the standpoint of most people don't do, don't buy a house every year. They don't buy a house every three years, every four years. So it's something that you're doing that you're not very comfortable doing anyway. And if you don't have a relationship with the person that you're working with on mm -hmm. that transaction, then it makes that transaction much more difficult, much more challenging to go through and, and could cause you some sleepless nights and some anxiety because, man, I just don't understand this. I don't know what's going on. You don't My have trust in right, exactly. them with the biggest decision and you're hoping they ask you all the questions you need to know, but no one's, I remember typically one question I always ask people, I'm like, uh, it doesn't even matter what I'm doing. I'm always like, what questions am I not asking that other people ask? <laughs> Because I, 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 like, I can't think of everything. And I remember thinking with you, like I, you, any question I came up with, you would always fire back three other questions that are around that question to really give me a bigger, wider picture of whatever question I was asking. And if you don't know the person on the other end, if you didn't know that I lived just 45 minutes south of you, that I was a veteran, that I was these things, and you understood my, why my family was doing this, you don't, I, I don't necessarily know that you're looking out for me. It's the same thing of buying a car. I don't buy a car from anybody that doesn't spend time trying to understand why I'm buying it. They don't spend time. Spend well, that time, I don't do business with that person. 
and see personally for me the buying buying a car process and i do use that when i talk to people i say you know i i don't i do not like being sold anything i don't mind somebody helping me buy something but i hate that feeling like i'm being sold something and unfortunately in the car business a lot of times that's how you feel is that you're just being sold something nobody's they're not really there to help you help you buy what you need and what you want to do and and that's how i look at my job my job is not to sit there and convince you to buy a home and convince you to do this kind mm -hmm. of mortgage or convince you to do that or whatever my job is to give you the information you know and and try to keep it on a level that that you can comprehend so that you can make a decision i i mean this is going to sound weird but i'm not a i'm not a smart guy okay i'm i'm not a genius i'm i'm not I'm just a down to earth, let's get her done kind of mentality. So when I have conversations with people, I try to explain things in a way that hopefully they can understand. And if they don't, then I'll go back through it again. But I want, ultimately, when my customer leaves my office, the last thing that I want them worried about when they're out there looking at a home is their financing. If they're out there worried about their financing when they're supposed to be looking at a home, then I don't think I've done my job very well. Mm -hmm. And I often like people in the LinkedIn community, they'll always use words like B2B businesses, B2C. And even in my podcasting, I've really said, I'm not in a B2C business category. I'm in a people to people category. Like, I feel like that's the next, even though it's 30 years old, but with the amount of social media and disconnection of human interaction that Anytime you have something that builds upon people to people, human to human connections without the words really business involved, you really know that you're in something special and that you can build something safe around it. Well, it just, you know, it's, it's the whole, the whole service part of what I do is what's important there. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do what I do that do it. And they don't really, it's, it, it's not about taking care of someone else's needs. It's about taking care of their own needs. And for me, that I could not, I could not work with a customer if I was working with them only because it was good for me. It, it, it's it's got to be good for them. In fact, it, should, it really should be, the important thing is that it's good for them. If it's not good for them, but it's only good for me, then, that, then we're, we're, in, we're doing the wrong thing. And sometimes I catch a lot of flack for that. Um, I try to meet with as many of my customers as I can face to face because for me, I think that's crucial. Um, I can't look in your eyes over the phone. I can't see if you've got that deer in the headlight look or if you've really got an, you know, if you're, I mean, and not that you have to walk out of my office and be able to explain everything we just went over to somebody else. That's not just you to calibrate even just correct to match with the just, energy that they're projecting. I just want to make sure that, that you understand it and that you've got it. Not that you can explain it to six or seven different people because that's, what's ultimately the most important thing. It's just so key to me to be able to do that. And plus, how can I have a relationship? I mean, how do you have a relationship with someone that you've never met? Uh, that, that doesn't work too well. At least I don't think so. Do you believe when you're a veteran looking for a VA loan, the category of finding the right mortgage officer is even more important and then the VA part will fall in line? Or do you find that the VA part still can be a little bit uh, of an issue when you're trying to find the right mortgage lender, even if you have the right person selling it? Well, unfortunately, in the real estate industry as a whole, in a lot of cases, if a veteran makes an offer and they, they have their offer contingent on VA financing, at least here in, in the Wisconsin, South, South, South Central Wisconsin market, they're getting multiple offers on homes, um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different offers. And a lot of times, if there's a VA offer in the mix, it automatically gets put to the bottom of the stack simply because VA loans are different loans. Mm -hmm. Just like FHA is a different loan. And, you know, I always use the analogy that I drive a Passat diesel. So if I took my Passat diesel to a guy that only works on gasoline engines, 
he could probably fix it. He could probably work on it. It might take him a little longer to get it done, but he'll probably get it done. Or maybe he won't because he's not familiar with what's going on and he might end up making it worse than it was. Well, VA loans and FHA loans and government loans in general are the same thing. They're not the same as a conventional one. They've got their own little idiosyncrasies and there are things that you have to do. Not, it's not harder. It's not bad. It's not worse. It's not better. It's just different. It just is. <laughs> and if you know what you're doing as a loan originator, if you know what you're doing on a VA loan, VA loans are... Honestly, they're one of the easier qualifying loans because of how the VA qualifies veterans. But when you put an offer out there and you've got a seller who maybe had a, or a, a real estate agent who maybe had a bad experience with a prior VA loan, well, that loan originator, you know, if the deal falls apart, if you run into an issue, the first thing the loan originator is going to do is they're going to kind of like add them. They're going to pass the blame, you know, well, it wasn't me. Well, you know, it's a VA loan. So they throw the VA program under the bus and that's really not fair. I've actually put together a letter specifically because of the fact that some of the veterans that I work with, their offers just weren't getting accepted. And they really should have because they made good offers and they weren't getting accepted, in my opinion, um, weren't being given the consideration that was due mainly because it was the VA loan and the sellers were afraid of what a VA loan meant. I had a realtor call me last week and told me that the reason that my veteran got their offer accepted was because of the fact that I have a letter that I put together. And in that letter, I, I lay it out and I say, you know, yes, they're applying for a VA loan with no money down. That doesn't make it a bad loan. And here's why. And I went through some of the scenarios and some of the myths yeah. about a VA loan and said, it's really, it's not necessarily that it's a VA loan. It's more important who, who is the lender. Because if you've got a lender that knows VA loans, you're going to get that loan done. I mean, it's, it's just going to happen that way. So that the lender is more important than the loan program is what I was trying to make clear to them. And um, hopefully it's helping. I've, I, I work with a lot of veterans and I enjoy working with veterans and it makes me a little bit upset angry, if you will, when I'm working with veterans and they can't get an offer accepted. So I'm trying to figure out different ways I can do to, or things I can do to help offers get accepted, which if I need to call listing agents and talk to them and, and explain the situation, it helps that Fairway is a pretty well-known company. Uh, we're a national company. We're, we're number five in VA originations across the country. And so a lot of the real estate agents in this area know Fairway Mortgage, and they're comfortable with Fairway Mortgage. And having been around for 30 years, a lot of them know who I am. And so if my name's on the letter and, be, and uh, Fairway's there as well, uh, they feel comfortable with that. So we just have to keep plugging away and take advantage of uh, every and little I, bit we can. Got connected, my realtor, uh, I said, I don't really have it figured out yet of who I wanted to go with. And uh, I was a little bit uh, frustrated from my pre first experience because I went with a local bank, no problems. The loan actually went perfectly fine. And then it, they sold it. And then I got sucked into Countrywide because that's where they sold it to. Then Countrywide went bankrupt. And then Bank of America bought Countrywide. And so then I was dealing with Bank of America, which doesn't have any branches anywhere nearby. And then I had to refinance that loan three times, which then caused the Norder to come by to my house three times and send a whole bunch of paperwork back and forth. And it was the most D personal experience in all of it. The only time I ever had someone like you was way back in the very beginning. And my loan is still with Fairway Mortgage. And um, real quick, uh, how do you think your story has evolved into how you show up as a mortgage officer? Interesting question. I've never, never quite thought of that. Um, I'm sure it had well, influence story, even just way back when, even not just cutting back the hours. Like, I'm right. sure you well, might have some showing up to the customer differently. Well, my, my story, I mean, prior to my divorce, uh, we, had, we actually had a lady that worked with me at my prior employment before I came to Fairway. And in talking to her after my divorce, she did make a comment. She goes, you know, Bob, she says, you're a completely different person than you were prior. And I, I looked at her and I went, really? And she goes, yeah. She says, I don't want to, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, or, but I, I, I'm actually trying to compliment you. She says, uh, back when? She says, there were several people in our office that knew that if, if you were calling, they didn't want to talk to you. 
so it my uh my experience really made me re look at how I do things, not only on a personal level, but also on a professional level. And it really helped me to, to people and right. Exactly. It helped me to change my, my, I'm not the most important person. And just because um, I think something doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way something should be done. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, I'm still a very, uh, <laughs> I'm still very opinionated, but I'm a little bit more um, reserved in voicing that opinion <laughs> let's say it that way <laughs> if anybody wanted to reach out to you bob what states are you licensed to do a mortgage in i am licensed in the great state of wisconsin it's only wisconsin only wisconsin yes so i'll make sure that every friend i know in wisconsin gets a copy of this episode and <laughs> knows that <laughs> they have a friend in madison uh with bob martin as we wrap up the show what's a parting piece of advice if you could wrap up your wisdom on the other side as a grandfather now, what's a parting piece of advice you want to leave for the military veteran dad out there at any stage of being a dad? Well, kids, kids are, well, for, for me, speaking for myself, uh, kids are the most important thing in my life. I, I love kids. I love my grandkids. I love spending time with them. And I just, I'm sorry that I ever lost sight of that. Um, I lost sight of it because I was too busy focusing on making sure that they had what I thought they needed and not necessarily focusing on how important that they really were to me. And my grandkids, um, a lot of people that have grandchildren say this as well. Grandchildren are so much easier to have than kids. Um, but I would say just make sure you love on your kids or your grandkids, whichever opportunity or at, at every opportunity that you have, because um, ultimately that's what that's really why you're here and that's what it's all about. And those kids are going to really remember the time that you spent with them more so than the toys that you might have bought them. And and I know everybody says that and everybody hears that, and it's it's hard when you're when you're a young dad. And you have to work because you got to bring food home, and you got to. Especially when you're trying place. to keep up with the Joneses. Exactly, but what? But just, just remember, new house, big new house next door, and you're like, "Oh, my house isn't as good yep. anymore." <laughs> yeah, and, and and just remember that you got to spend, you got to balance things out. And then again, I know that's really easy to to say. Um, yeah. But ultimately, that's that I think is the one thing I I would leave with anybody that's listening is just make sure that you balance things out. Spend some time with the kiddos. Do something. Doesn't have to be anything that costs money could just be, you know, hanging out or uh, whatever. Just spend the time with them and let them, let them know that they're the most important thing in your life. And we didn't dive into it, but every episode will be remind dads that kids spell love, T-I-M-E. And at the simplest moments, all they really need and value the most is your time. That is the most valuable currency you have at any stage of grandchildren. And, and you, it's often funny how our life works that as grandfathers, we often are more wise than how to show up in our kid's life then. And we often probably wish that we had that wisdom back then when, when we're actually at the more core of changing a kid of who he is, but we actually don't get to raise our kids at the most wisest parts of our life. Absolutely. I would agree hundred percent with that. Well, Bob, I absolutely loved hearing your story today and I'm really Happy that you starved your fear and came on the podcast and broke, <laughs> broke the seal and did your first podcast interview. And uh, I know I am positive we brought some dads home with this episode and hopefully let them and gave them permission to let go of what's on their heart and reconnect with their families. Well, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I appreciate you reaching, reaching out and not letting me... Uh... And not letting me give up on, on doing this. I, I enjoy doing it. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And I'll include Bob's contact information in the show notes of this episode if you do live in the state of Wisconsin and want to reach out. Um, is Fairway licensed in all 50 states? We are. And so if someone were looking for something outside of Wisconsin, I can either hook them up or just do a Google search for Fairway. That's actually a good idea. Area. I would trust any recommendation from you for another mor mortgage loan officer. So... If you want to find another Bob in a different state, contact Bob and he'll hook you up. There you go. 
I'm sure Bob's Rolodex is filled with other Bobs in Fairway. <laughs> well, thank you, Sounds Bob, for coming good. on the show you and have a good you afternoon. Know, I appreciate it. You too, Dad. Thank you. That's a wrap. And thank you for listening to today's show, and I really hope you enjoyed it. The lifeblood of any new podcast are the reviews. If you haven't reviewed the podcast yet in iTunes, I would really appreciate it, and you will help us get the message out to even more military veteran dads. As John Maxwell says, if there is hope in the future, there is power in the present. Dads, it's time to come home.